First of all, we will have the opening statements from each of the candidates. The lucky person who drew number one is Mary Ellen Kay. Now, we do have a microphone here somewhere. Yes. Good evening. Thank you very much for hosting this Canadian Federation of University of Learning. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is a good turnout. I was kind of concerned. My name is Mary Ellen Kay, and I've been in this city volunteering, working, being a, a decent neighbor since 1997. Whenever, I, whenever my neighborhood has an issue, water problems, flooding, uh, development issues along the Grand River where, where houses are cutting off the traditional access points and there's no plan in place, I'm the person that would, that we all gathered together and I, we'd put together a petition and I'd be the one bringing it to City Council. When I'm, I'm the one that stood out in the rain when, there, when Waterloo Street was, was still flooding over these years and guess what, it was an easy, easy solution. Somebody had to go down there and it was one of the gates that would keep the river from coming back in. So not all solution, not all problems have an expensive solution. That's one thing I have learned in the advocacy part as a neighbor who stands up for her neighborhood. We don't have that problem. It's been four years. All it was was a gate. That's all it was. All these years. So I know that not every not every problem has an expensive solution, but it does take effort. One of the things that caught my eye when I looked at um, I, this has been on my refrigerator door since July 20th of 2013, Detroit. I went to University of Windsor as my, for my undergraduate degree. And I've, I've clipped that out from the expositor and I put it on my fridge. And it's going to be up here so anybody at the end can come and take a look at it. I was on the Brownfield Committee in Brantford that tried, uh, that tried to nag City Hall to get the Brownfields done. And this is one, that, one I have to tell you. 2013, 78,000 abandoned buildings, 66,000 abandoned lots. That was a 50, that was a 50-year cycle that I'd like to see stopped in Brantford. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Number two is John Turmel. Well, I'm known as the engineer for having financed the first local employment training software, time banking. The best example is which single parents pay each other with one hour bills to babysit each other's kids. Another simple variant is paying students with bus tickets to shovel or snow. And of course that was done, which would, could be paid with the transit card. Hong Kong paid their students with their octopus transit card. And the third thing I'll be talking about are like time currencies. And guess what? The Bank of Brantford 1858, here's a $2 bill. We did have Brantford's own money. And here's a Bank of Brantford $5 bill. And a $4 bill. But anyway, the point is, I'll be talking about community currencies all evening, but focusing on bus tickets for a second, we have three other candidates in Brantford running into wards. In Ward 2, Jennifer McDonald. In Ward 4, Bob Brown. In Ward 5, David Swanson. All support paying kids with bus tickets on their cards. We just got eight candidates in Toronto who now support bus bucks in Toronto, which means our bus bucks will be usable there and theirs will be usable here. And those are Josh Bornstein in Ward 4, Shalant Handel Ward 1, John Matanja Ward 6, Istan Tar Ward 13, Mike Andrea Ward 20, Rob Wolven Ward 27, John Papadakis Ward 29, and Janet Sherbanovsky Ward 31. And all it took Josh was to call up and say, is it a good idea to pay kids with their transit card credits to shovel our snow in these upcoming snowstorms? We got eight in two days in Toronto. Now we're going after candidates in other towns who want to trade bus bucks with Branford. But guess what? If the four of us get elected, you're going to have kids shoveling your snow this winter and you won't have to pay for it. Thank you very much, John. Uh, the, the mic is over there. I don't know, Jan, whether you want to use it. You're number three. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jan. I am the standing council for 
Council for Ward 1. I served four years, Brantford City Council, and it's time for me to run for the Mayor's office. My wife, Linda, and I own and operate two businesses in Brantford. I have uh, spent probably 40 years, my wife has probably spent 45 years in customer service. We know how to listen. And apparently, this organization, and thank you, by the way, for holding the debate, this organization also knows how to listen, and listen closely, and listen well. I love the language that is part of your purpose. Your purpose is it's, it's advocate, it's promote, it's promote, it's advocate, it's make possible. It's, it's amazing what you do within your organization to promote the interests and connections that are made between people within your organization. 10,000 strong in Canada. Our small family, three daughters and two boys, the, you know, the oldest boy and the youngest boy are in Canadian military service as we speak. The three daughters are in post-secondary education institutions in southern Ontario. My wife and I understand the safety that goes along with that equation. We understand the relationships that are built within that framework of education, uh, more so than, than, than many others, because we've had that active involvement and engagement with our daughters and with our sons to be sure that they're safe wherever they go. They're safe not only at the school, but in transit from the school to where they live. And they're safe where they live. It's, it's, it's incumbent on us as leadership to ensure safety so that all of these other pieces and parts of what your organization promotes can be held strong and true and build the relationships that you deserve to have for the rest of your time. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question. Uh, is, is it better if we use the mic? Sorry, I'm sure. yeah. Yes, I think people, it's a long way to the back back there, you know, okay. Uh, so candidate number four knows who he is. His name is Mark Littell. Thank you very much, and I'll stay seated and excuse my cold, everybody. Stop the bloating. The current council and mayor have much to account for over the last four years. They have allowed spending to spiral out of control with no plan to effectively restrain it. Over $16.8 in new spending added one new department, and added 39 new staff positions. I have to digress for a minute because I was reading the brand news, and Natalie, you put this in there, and I'll just pull it from the paper. It said, Frill said claims that there have been 39, I'm sorry, I shut it off. Frill said claims that there have been 39 new hires over the last term of council is false. He said the city staffing areas that saw increases were the creation of a bylaw enforcement department. The mayor is challenging my details about the bloating staff at City Hall, suggesting they are made up or false. I have the list of all the hires as supplied through the Human Resources Department, and not only does it include the 39 plus hires, the new commission de the department that began as a department includes all new part-timers. I'm happy to provide that with everybody, anybody. They've also spent $50,000 wasted on the rebranding of the letter B, $107,000 to redo the Gretzky signage. Over $15 million in Gretzky, uh, the Gretzky uh, overru overruns. $2.5 million shifted from infrastructure improvements and applied to the operating budget to avoid increasing taxes, still leaving us with an infrastructure deficit. Eliminated two advisory boards, $3.5 million in employee gapping, a problem that compounds over the next year mismanaged the relations with our neighbors, six nations, and the county, which are at an all-time low. As a community leader and serving as Ward 1 Councillor, I know the best ideas are improved upon by engaging citizens and stakeholders to promote a uh, better community. I guess I'll stop there because I'm going to run out of time anyway, so maybe I'll get my other two pages in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, please turn off your cell phones so that we don't get that kind of distraction while people are talking. Yes, Chris Field. It's time for Branford to start to dream again. It's time for us to start to think big. It's time for us to start to think about ourselves as more than we do right now. 20 years ago when I was first elected, we were a community that was tired. We had gone through a hard process of deindustrialization, and during the last 20 years, through, and under my leadership, we completely reinvented our community, and we're continuing to do that. 
We're doing it on a daily basis. But Brantford has become a progressive community. We're cutting edge. And we recognize across this province as a community that is a leader. In fact, I was at a, an organization today, a national organization for SEPTED because they're coming to study what we've been able to do in our downtown. Just another example of it. During the last four years, this council has been very conscious of the fact that we have laid the foundation for where we need to go to allow ourselves to dream, to allow ourselves to think big. We started and laid down the Smart Brantford Initiative, which is a community-based, broad-based initiative, which has dozens of volunteers and is a complete philosophical change in our economic development. We started and, and are now moving very quickly on Safe Brantford, which deals with issues related to safety and crime, both in our downtown but across the entire community. And because I was listening and we heard what was, people were saying, there were concerns about health care, about being able to access doctors, uh, being able to have walk-in clinics. So we started Healthy Brantford, and we have a broad-based community initiative involved with that and a number of providers who are helping out. But this community, or this council, did not uh, rest on its laurels. In the last four years, we've created more than 4,000 jobs. We've been involved in 53 new industries that have moved into this community. And this council is the lowest tax council in the last 15 years. And I know with my plan for multi-year budgeting, we'll even see a bigger decrease in the amount that we would tax across the next four years. It is time for Brantford to start to dream and start to think big. It is time for us to be what we know we can be and what we all believe we have in our hearts. Our next candidate is Michael St. Amant. Thank you. I, I'm a, a person whose uh, experience is in business. I've had 40 years of working with companies, pr predominantly companies that were in financial difficulty or had management problems. And my job was to go in and turn them around. During the course of that work history, I discovered that, that sometimes it's important to stop and pause and before you move on to the big dream, before you create the next set of uh, programs, you have to sit down and get your house in order. One of the problems we face in Brantford is essentially our property taxes continue to rise. The mayor argues that uh, they're uh, a low tax rising council. Great. What about a no tax rising council? One of the issues that we have to address are the whole series of things that come up election after election. We're on a treadmill. Count, county, city, uh, land adjustments. Issues with First Nations. Infrastructure issues. Tax increase issues. Greenfield or, or brownfields. The list goes on, but it's not well, for those of you who've lived in, in Brantford for a long time, you recognize that these issues continue to go on and on and on. I'm a family guy, I have three children, they've gone to university, I was lucky enough to teach at Laurier here for a while. And I, I want to make this community better, and that's why I'm running. I'm not running about a grand vision, I'm running about let's get fiscally responsible, Let's get our city moving the way it should be. Let's create the jobs we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's only one left, so he's the one. Dave Robel is the last. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll pass the mic because I do this for a living. Uh, for 13 years, uh, I have been a promoter of individuals in skilled trades and construction industry from young men and women, very much like yourselves, who want to be involved and encouraged to do. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dave Robel. It's time we had a plan. We started this term of council with ideas and thoughts, but nothing that we could benchmark ourselves with. Plans, ladies and gentlemen, help us gauge our level of success. Plans that will benefit you, plans that will benefit staff, plans that will benefit this community as a whole. In order to have a plan, ladies and gentlemen, we can all talk grandiose ideas about development and accountability and value for your tax dollars. But we need to make sure that we also build consensus within our own ranks of council. Use words like all instead of most or some, because all members of council must come together, all members of council must work as a unified, cooperative and cohesive team 
to advance this community for you. That means focusing on things like signing bylaws. That means focusing on things that will get things done for you. That includes a four-year budgeted plan that is at the heart and brainchild of Councillor Carpenter and Councillor Utley, and that's part of building a team. Giving the credit, ladies and gentlemen, where credit is due. For the last 13 years, I've brought students forward and inspired them. I want to inspire you. I want to inspire members of council. I want to inspire our community. I've developed those skills through business, through entrepreneurial leadership, through community involvement with more than 80 community organizations and volunteer organizations, through churches and service clubs. Those types of skills are hard to come by, but 30 years is what I'm bringing to you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's thought for you. Thank you, Dave. Before we go on, does anyone have a question that they would like the question team to pick up? If you just hold it up, then they can come and take it from you. Put it down here. very much. Uh, the first preset question which we have for the, the candidates, how will you take leadership and accountability for making Brantford an age-friendly community in implementing the Master Aging Plan? I'll read that one again because the audience hasn't heard this. H how will you take leadership and accountability for making Brantford an age-friendly community in implementing the Master Aging Plan. Now, as I said, the questions will be answered randomly. The first one for this question is number two, John Turmel. Well, not only will I pay the students on their transit cards to shovel your snow for free after snowstorms, if you go see my interview with Vincent Ball at the Expositor, it's at their site and I published it at YouTube, just look for Bus Bond Bucks. And it also explains the time bank idea. Remember the hour bills that pay for babysitting back and forth? Well, I practice my accordion at old folks' homes. Yesterday I did Riverview, I do Amber Lee and John Noble, but I wouldn't play otherwise. So. What I do, they sign me a one-hour witness that I contributed to my community, and within our time bank network, that's as good as having babysat your kids. So, anybody can do good work and have their witness sign your time dollar, and I want to set up a big such system for poor people and weak people to participate. Thank you, John. The second person is number four, Mark Littell. Oh, hey, just wait, we'll get there. It's okay. all random. It's okay, all random. Sorry. sorry. Okay. <laughs> Threw me off completely. Yeah, I didn't right. know you well, were going. Well, that's what we're trying so. to do. Hey, but I we promised succeeded. my phone would go off there. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's necessary for us as a city to adapt to meet the needs of our senior citizens. There are some aspects of this plan that also coincide with the World Health Organization or studies. The focus is not just on health services, but encompasses transportation, housing, recreation, safety, and other community services. I agree with the aspect that it allows for proactive planning rather than reacting to crisis and information necessary for planning for future needs. Other than the buses being more friendly, the plan presented in 2008 has become a shelf study with the city over the last four years. I plan to make this the way we do business instead of it being a separate agenda subject. Expand on transit, hold taxes so seniors may stay in their homes, and make sure there's an adequate housing stock to meet the needs of downsizing seniors. In the next 10 years, 35% or more will be over the age of 65. 35% of our population. Some with little or no pension. We have to react to that. Thank you. Our next speaker, number six, Michael St. Germain. Thank you. The, uh, I guess I should point out I'm a senior, so I, I've got a vested interest in the answer to this question. Um, the master plan addresses a, a whole range of issues ranging from housing on through to transportation, safety, and health care. 
But the challenge that faces us is, is, is beyond the normal set of programs that, that uh, we put in place. So over 66% uh, of people working today um, don't have pension plans. And as they graduate, they're going to be on fixed incomes. There's going to be challenges for them to stay in their homes. We're going to have to address property tax issues because otherwise they're going to face difficulty. We've got an increasing number of people with Alzheimer's and dementia, and that number is growing exponentially. On top of that, um, women are the people who stay in the house longer than men. We got to meet those challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ellen Kay, number one. Well, what I'm finding is one of the first phone calls when somebody received my flyer in the mailbox was Mary Ellen, I'm already there, 72. She's $500 is what she's been paying to a family to live there. She has to find a place before February. She's the one that let me know that, uh, yes, it's five to seven years waiting list for a one-bedroom apartment in Brantford, but Lauren Towers, she was told that it's a year and a half. Brant Towers, a year and a half. Beckett Building, a year, two years and a half, two and a half years. She's turning 72 in November. She's panicking. That's a typical story that I hear. There's also people much younger than that, in their 50s, who have had a health problem, a stroke, and they said, yes, Mary Ellen, I, I need to take the bus. It's been a hard, hard go of it. Some of, and there is a push in healthcare to have seniors stay in their homes. It saves a lot of money on the healthcare when seniors stay in their homes. However, the difficulty is, is in the urban sprawled environment that Brantford has created over the past decades, we have a hard time getting personal support workers on buses to there because it is not a high paying job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number three, Jen Vanderstoke. I wasn't, no, I wasn't going to trip you. <laughs> uh, Six-year-old plan. The city has a lot of plans, and, and good on the city for that. Is it an interactive plan? I say no. I scoured this plan for today's version of it. I was looking for the response line that first uh, frontline support care givers have to contact whomever it may be in whatever service may be necessary to help the people they're serving. Where do you get most of your answers about what needs to happen for a senior in any stage of, of their life? You get it from the frontline care workers. So although we did some feedback, Although we've been listening, it's the frontline care workers that need to have access to tell government what needs to be uh, held in priority, what needs to be planned for. We should pay closer attention to not only what they observe, but also what they are predicting to be the needs in the future. We've seen that with a number of different uh, scenarios in Brantford, and this is just one of them. Thank you, Jim. Number seven, Dave Robel. Oh, he's going to break that. No, he's not. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not a mic person. If I can cast the voice, I will. I think that there is the, the question of accountability for leadership and how we work cohesively with the aging master plan or the aged in our community and those who will find ourselves there in no time at all. I think one of the areas we have to start with is understanding your needs, not just something that's dropped into a report that says, this is what you need to give consideration to. Knocking at the doors, ladies and gentlemen, gives you a, an idea, but being involved and engaged in the Seniors Resource Center on a daily basis to sit down with the seniors who come in and make use of the services gives you a pretty gosh darn good idea of what's needed and where the services fall short. Transportation, home care, keeping us in our homes instead of putting us in age homes where we feel comfortable and we feel secure in our own place. But we need to continue to listen. And most important of all, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for pointing, but I'm emphatic. I'm a believer in doing something about it as opposed to sitting on my can and shelving a report. I want to work with you to move it forward. I'm going to do it. Get it done. Thank you, Dave. Now we'll hear from Chris Frio. <laughs> Am 
Master Aging Plan is continuing to be worked by the Council on Aging, which even two weeks ago had a, a tour of seniors throughout our city to start to identify some of the services that are available to them. This group has been working with our social services department uh, over the last four years to really try and find and identify those issues that are important to seniors and doing it very effectively. Um, so it's not been shelved, it's actually a working plan and it's been going on and will continue to go on. Council needs to make this a strategic priority in the next council. Uh, we've done uh, enough work with the council on aging. Um, the two issues that come from this master servicing plan which are important or remain important to us are housing. Um, and I proposed uh, that we turn Lauren Towers and uh, Brent Towers back into seniors housing and make a connection between the two so that there's an opportunity and then find other opportunities for housing. And then transportation is the other issue that we have to work on. We brought Brantford Lift into our system, um, longer hours, better service, but we have to start thinking about allowing seniors to be independent and that's uh, one of the most important parts of the plan. Thank you very much. You've given us lots to think about on that issue. The second question, of course, has, has a long history. We've been fighting this one for a long time. What leadership role will you play and how will you take accountability for policies that address violence against women and girls and safety in general? I'll just repeat that. What leadership role will you play and how will you take accountability for policies that address violence against women and girls and safety in general. And Jan, you get to speak first. Thank you. In case it wasn't clear enough, listening. We need to listen well to the people who suffer from whatever it is that they're suffering from. So when it comes down to safety, I want to know where people feel unsafe, when they feel unsafe, how they feel unsafe, why they feel unsafe, and use that information carefully to make sure that we provide safety in all steps, in all stages, at all times of day, at all times of night. We want to make sure that we're listening well because you want to cover all the bases. You don't want to leave any cracks in our system. We have an obligation due diligence and, and sound governance, we have an obligation to provide safety for people of all walks of life, of all ages. But we can only do that when we effectively listen and implement the changes that need to be made to keep people safe. I think it's something that is an ongoing effort. It's something that we need to pay more attention to, and I'm happy to do that. Michael Saint-Demont. You know, if you look at the studies, the roots and causes of violence, and particularly violence against women, are, are not clear. I mean, some, some reports argue it's family, some reports argue it's biological, other reports argue that it's uh, the result of, uh, of uh, general environment. Reality is, I mean, you know, what we do in society is we don't treat cause, but we treat as result. So if we got a problem, drug addiction, we, we build a drug uh, addiction treatment center. Uh, we rely on places like Nova Vida to work with um, uh, uh, women in distress uh, when they, they have problems. But I think at the same, uh, one of the things that we really have to get into is addressing those issues on the front line. And where you address them on the front line is you start education in the school systems. You support programs like the Kindness Project that was sponsored by Freedom House. You address issues that service the people that need it and change the environment that, in which violence occurs. Thank you. Number two, John Trumel. Well, the reason is they can't escape, and usually because they can't afford to escape. Now, of course, I suggested at the university the debate earlier that they have more proctors watch the university and pay them with tuition credits. Good idea, right? Some students could pay their tuition by proctoring and watching over the university. Same way, I talked about the Argentine solution where provinces pay their employees with provincial bonds in order to avoid layoffs. We could do the same thing with municipal bonds and those employees who take them free up cash for us to hire more cops. So, 
With more community currency, we can pay for more protection in neat new ways. Otherwise, they want to <coughs> fix it, but they got no money! Thank you, John. Chris Friel is next, number five. Last week I was at the uh, Sisters of Spirit uh, program, which was held at Woodland Cultural Center. Uh, discussing the number of missing and murdered Aboriginal women across this country and the fact that we need an inquiry. Um, the City of Brantford needs to work with, and I've had this conversation with Chief Hill, work with Six Nations as one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, Aboriginal community in Canada to uh, start to address this issue. Um, we could be a very strong voice on their behalf. Uh, sexual assaults continue to be a crime uh, category that uh, has been very much a problem in the city of Brantford. It is an area that we need to work on. This is what Safe Brantford is all about. It's the community coming together in broad-based community initiatives, even working down to enforcement and a crisis table, which addresses the individuals and the families who are in crisis. Instead of worrying and waiting till the end of the process, we get to the heart of the matter at the beginning of the process, and we start to work with them in their homes, the individuals, find out what their situation is and where they need to be able to go. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Dave Robel doesn't want a mic. <laughs> what an incredibly difficult topic to talk about. Like mental health, there's physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and financial abuse. Ladies, even men, we all live with it, and yet we bury our heads shamefully because we don't wish to acknowledge it, or when we do, we do it out of fear. And it has to be a comfort that we have to be able to stand up with and say, this is what has happened to us. But where are the support mechanisms in our community? Are they here? Yes, they are, but we need to pull those support mechanisms together, <coughs> pool the ideas, pool the thoughts, and create the resources, a unified resource center that assists people in getting educated Coming comfortable with these situations and then marching forward to put an end to those types of abuse that we live with on a daily life. Thank you, Dave. Number one, Mary Ellen Kay. This issue, this issue is very dear to me. It's very hard. It's, it's been something that throughout my entire life, it's been a great concern to me. I am committed to seeing a reduction in crime. I understand that crime and social issues are interrelated. I'm committed to developing a long-term multifaceted approach to help people overcome addiction, substance abuse, mental health, difficult housing, and social economic con conditions, sorry, that actually gets on the ground to the people, the voter at the door, the person in our residence, in our neighborhoods, that actually meets the kids and the families. Getting a grade six program where the police officer comes into your classroom to, to warn you about the dangers of drugs is not enough. We have a big addiction problem in Ontario. It's the number one problem, identify the family physicians. Brantford Doug has lots of plans, but the, I don't see anything at the door. I have men that have came up to, told, to tell me, men in this, this time canvassing around, that have told me at the time that they were mugged walking somebody home. Cell phone robbed, something robbed out of their pockets, they didn't hear of any plans. They didn't have any reaction. So everybody needs to be safe. Thank you, Mary Ellen. That leaves Mark Littell. Thank you, Reverend. During my term on council, the task force on domestic abuse was created. And we supported it with our priorities that began in the first year. I also advocated and was successful in adding a new child porn officer during my term on the police services board. The police services have been very instrumental on focusing on zero tolerance towards domestic abuse, a policy I also supported. What we need to do is concentrate on better reporting to support this. The province reduced funding to victim services by 25% starts in 2015. This has to be renewed or brought back. I will advocate as mayor for additional funding for that agency along with Nova Vida and other agencies along with the right amount of police presence. Fighting the province for money to assist will put teeth into this issue. Thank you very much. 
as university women, we're very interested in education, of course, so this third question will be no surprise to you. What are your plans to expand Brantford as a university slash college town? What are your plans to expand Brantford as a university or college and or college town? And the first one will be Dave Rubell. Well, I was kind of taken back by that. I thought maybe it would be something about encouraging people to get involved in the universities and the college system. I think the colleges and the universities here in our community have already developed a very strong foothold. What can we do? I think we can work with those colleges and universities, in fact, bringing additional college partners in to create pathways within our community to go from one college to the next college and over to a university. That, I believe, becomes beneficial, but not just beneficial for the residents, it becomes beneficial for the students, both male and female alike. Because in our particular growing and changing industry, it is wonderful to encourage that level of education to encourage our young people, our young men, and our young women to get involved in business and in industry because there's the capability to do that. And that's how we're going to be able to do that in small steps. But we have to do it in partnership, in cooperation with the colleges and the universities. And that includes knocking on their front doors to say, why not Brantford? Thank you. Our second speaker is Mary Ellen Kay, number one. A lot of people are asking about, uh, and a lot of people have said at the door that they're glad to hear Laurie's here, and, and they're glad to see the university students here. One of the problems is, is we, we've lost Mohawk, we've lost different college connection, a, a college connection, and that's one of the things that I would like to see brought back. Transit's going to be one of those things that link campuses, link people to different places. We need to get an integrated transit system. Uh, my friend in St. John's, he said, the students are very happy out there in St. John's, Newfoundland. They got an A, by the way, from the conference board in Canada. Wi-Fi is available on their, on their system, on their buses. You can, it's easy to get on there. And that's what, that's what we need to do to be a university town, to be a college town, is to have support systems so that you can go from your, the city where you're living to Brantford, just on the internet. You can find out where the buses are and you can get yourself around within a budget. That's one of the next steps that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Number five, Chris Friel. We've had remarkable success in the 15 years that uh, Lori has been here. And, and being at the uh, ribbon cutting uh, and involved in the earliest stages, it's far exceeded our expectations uh, where we wanted to be able to go. We need to start working with uh, Laurier for a broader plan, a uh, broader plan to work within an urban campus setting. We have 3,000 students right now. They're looking to grow to 15,000 students. Where are we going to house them? We have to start looking at what these issues are going to be related to housing. We have to um, consider what their growth patterns are going to be so that we can also be involved with meeting them. We need to talk about transit, go to bus service, which we're working on. We have the business plan in. is very important to students right now. Uh, we need to continue to partner. And even when Mohawk College made its own decision to move out of our community, we were quick and now have Conestoga College within the community, and they have grown even in their second year. So we continue to have a college presence that's only going to get bigger. We are the leaders in the province in how we manage our relationship between municipalities and post-secondary, and we should be recognized for that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, number two, John Turmel. <clears throat> Well, the easy way to induce more people to want to come here is to provide greater safety and greater employment opportunities. Now, you notice how paying students with tuition credits, empty classroom seats, is a lot like paying students with bus tickets for empty bus seats. It's using unused capacity to get work out of unemployed people. So, that would allow such a system to provide maximum security and maximum employment opportunity. And with those two conditions, how can it not expand? Thank you, John. Jan Vanderstoep. <coughs> Thank you, Nora. Again, uh, it is incumbent upon the municipality to listen and listen carefully to uh, not only the plans for university and college expansion uh, in ever-increasing concentric circles around the core as far as housing goes and straight safe travel goes, but also listen to the students. 
listen to the parents, find out what kind of services they are looking for within the core or slightly outside of it. Make sure that we address their concerns and their needs and their interests. Make sure that we provide proper accommodations for parents, uh, proper services. Make sure that if there is a to-do list or a needs list that students identify as our population grows in the core, that we do everything we can to listen well enough, record well enough, and answer well enough with the kinds of services, um, safety, transportation, and housing interests that they bring to us. But it all starts with listening to those bodies of people. Thank you, John. Number four, Mark Lutell. Thank you, Reverend. As a counselor, I chaired the South Side of Colbert Task Force, which was successful in dealing with a 35-year problem. Since then, several new businesses have invested in downtown. An investment of over $100 million has occurred, with at least $100 million following. Five quick ideas. One, to replace Mohawk College who deserted us, we need to strengthen the relationship with Conestoga that began in 2009. Two, encourage private sector investment to enhance not just housing, but entertainment, restaurants, and commerce. Three, begin development of the remainder of south side of Culver Street which has sat empty for the last four years. Four, develop a municipal housing plan for students and disadvantaged residents. And lastly, a transporta transportation infrastructure to reflect a walkable, friendly center. An example of a missed opportunity was William Street is just getting done. Why didn't we make that pedestrian friendly in the downtown university district? Thank you. Thank you. Michael. If I was mayor, I'd have a wish list of what I'd love to talk to Laurier about. The, um, as the campus grows, the city continues to contribute, and we truly have a partnership. But it's a partnership that's being financed by the taxpayers of uh, Brantford. In return for, for the investment that Brantford has made in, in supporting Laurier, I would like to see, for example, some of the science, technology, and engineering programs stay here because they're the programs that will create entrepreneurial activity, create jobs, and keep students here. The curriculum, the way it's set up, means that we have students for eight months, and four months it impacts our, our retail businesses because they can't support us. I would like to open that dialogue up with the university and say, let's get a deal that works for both of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the last of our set questions for the candidates, and I do have three from the audience. I'd like to take this opportunity, however, if someone else has thought of something in the meantime and has a question you would like to submit. We've got one right down here, and another one there, and another one there. Oh, wow, they're popping up all over the place. And I'm also going to suggest that we all stand up and stretch. It's a long evening.
off for resting. Now we have to get back to work. Our first question from the audience now, now, which is our question number four, reads like this. In 1980, Brantford and Brantford Township and the province created our very own green belt. Will you protect this green belt, yes or no, and why? Do I need to repeat that? Is that something everybody knows about? Anyway. The first one is Mark Littell, number four. The answer is yes, that we would protect the green belt, but we have to find a way because under the province places to grow, we're designated as one of the places to grow. There's only so much infill that we can be involved with. So we have to find the happy medium there where we're protecting as much green space as we can, we're, uh, we're protecting enough agricultural property as we can, but we still have to grow. Our costs continue to go up as a municipality through wages and salaries, and we need to do our best to attract new industry. So, yes, I would protect the green space and find a way to work with the county to do that. Okay, thank you. Second person is number three, John Vanderstout. A complicated yes. Um, we will, uh, unfortunately, be subject to what people choose. Uh, people choose larger areas of land. People choose not to buy in places that build up, but rather build out. It's a cultural choice. We have to be cognizant of the fact that we will not build sky rises inside of the current built boundaries of Brantford. And leave the rest to green space. It simply won't happen because consumer choice doesn't support it, doesn't bear it. Also, the pressure from the province places to grow dictates that we must expand our boundaries to a certain extent in order to accommodate those choices. The province is well aware that's how we choose to build in North America, that's what we're stuck with. So by degrees, we can find the common middle ground which allows us to do a little bit of development into green space but maintain the majority of it and that's the goal that's a realistic goal that i can staple myself to uh, sorry stay for bell terrific because this kind of leads into the whole idea of boundary negotiations and making sure we protect the agricultural and natural canopies and our naturalization areas that we have, including places like Whitman's Creek, Fairchild's Creek, that all have to be carefully monitored and carefully protected. Individuals, farmers, will want to sell their land because agriculture has become a thing of the past for them and there are very few families who will continue to pick up that hurdle. There are businesses and there are developers who sit on the bounds of our municipality who have in some way secured those particular lands for development. The key issue is finding ways to work with them and those farmers who have sold their lands as options to those developers and protect those agricultural lands beyond those borders of where they're going to develop, protect the naturalization areas that are there. Uh, we've got some great examples of it. Uh, on Garden Avenue that have just done uh, $2.8 million worth of repair because of damages done from uh, development. It's going to be very, very careful, but it has to be done modestly, respectfully, in conjunction with other individuals and partners to do so. Thank you. Michael St. Amon. Told Mark to sit down for one question. The, <laughs> um, we have to preserve the green belt. I, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see what choice there is. We live in a society uh, that demands we have ecological and environmental safety as much as we have development. I disagree uh, with, with Jan. There, there's nothing wrong with growing up and building up because it, 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 it does work. It's worked in cities like Guelph where they made the adjustment. It's worked in cities like Waterloo, Kitchener. Why not 
take a look at the way we operate here, go back to the drawing board, and if part of the solution can be that we can grow up, then let's do that because that provides a good solution. Thank you. Uh, John Tremell? I agree. Let's do whatever we can do. Is anybody against green spaces? No. Is anybody against expansion when we have to house people? No. So there's that conundrum. And everybody would love to see a solution. Me too. So, what could happen? The only difference between me and them is that if I were in council, we'd have more money. And I wonder if having more money would make solutions of boundary discussions easier. Two guys with enough chips versus two guys with no chips. Who do you think is going to come to a deal faster? So as long as we're all bleeding interest to the banks for using bank money, yeah, we're never going to be able to resolve these problems. But if we could come up with the alternate currencies in our town that made everybody pretty flush, I think more solutions may arise. But yeah, I'm in favor of more green space, and I'm in favor of expansion when you need it, too. <laughs> Chris Frio. Well, everybody else is for both. <laughs> <laughs> Count my time, didn't it? <laughs> the 1980 agreement uh, was an annexation agreement. The city of Brantford needs to be able to grow. The land that was chosen in the northern part of the of, uh, north of the city was chosen because it's a low-grade uh, farmland. There is exceptionally good farmland in the city of Brantford, or city, or city of the county of Brant, I should say, to the southeast, the southwest, and particularly to the southwest. Um, it is exceptionally good. A green belt is an absolute necessity. If you look at the green belt that comes out of the GTHA, it literally stops at the border of the County of Bram and does not move in. Why is that? I would like to take the green belt actually one step farther and move into a concept called a food belt, which is about protecting food producers within our community so that the city as an urban core and the rural uh, area in Bram work together. And this is also part of the proposal for a 100 mile diet. We are perfectly positioned as Brantford and Brant County working together to create both a food belt, which is much more extensive than a, a green belt, uh, but also work on a 100 mile diet so that we are getting our food grown by our neighbors. Thank you. Mary Ellen. Local money would help that too. <laughs> <laughs> He's right, it would. <laughs> When I, think about the, when I think about the land that I drive down to go out to 99, the area that was selected, it's beautiful farmland. I don't know what you mean by low grade, but it's beautiful farmland. I'd like to see it all protected. That's some of the thinking that went into Detroit. They, they built suburbs, subdivisions, subdivisions, didn't take, it, didn't take care of the core. You look it up. That is the, that is the type of thinking that years down the road is going to lead to I mean, right now we have a D. Any city that does urban sprawl the way we do is going to stay with a D from the, as a quality of life and higher taxes because it is more economical. We do need to grow up. The provincial policy statements, no, we need to grow up. We need to be more compact in our style of development. More walkable neighborhoods where you can get around easily. Transit works better in those. And we need to preserve the farmland. It's ridiculous. And I think people are glad to see the delay because I think when I heard people, they were just appalled at the massive, massive amounts of land that were in that negotiation. That's what I'm hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, the next question is, uh, it has sort of a lot of parts to it, so I think I'm going to arbitrarily say we'll allow you two minutes on this one. Uh, because it, uh, there are a lot of possible answers to it. It has to do with ongoing development and transportation. So what are your plans to promote ongoing development in Brantford in a variety of sectors? So you'll have to think about which sector you're thinking of. With the resulting pressure on transportation. 
very real problem around here. And we had a specific question that they're particularly concerned about access to 403 from the Shellard Lane area. I'd like to think about that for a minute. So, what are your plans to promote ongoing development in Brantford in a variety of sectors with the resulting pressure on transportation and particularly with uh, the problems around the Shellard Lane area access to 403? And the first person who gets to answer that one is Chris Frito. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> and for this one, you'll have two minutes. Promote ongoing developments, impact on transportation, and access to the 403 from Shelby Lane area. Um, the southwest part of the city, actually, that was part of the 1980 uh, annexation agreement. The northwest was considered industrial. Um, it was originally proposed to be residential, but it was argued against um, uh, by the county because of, of its proximity to the town of Paris. So it was moved to the southwest. There are 8,100 people who live out there right now. By the end of the build out in the southwest, there's going to be about 17,000 people. There needs to be more development in the southwest uh, for commercial uh, in particular. We are looking at, and uh, Councillor Larry Kings has been driving the process uh, to make sure Shelter Lane is getting redeveloped, and but also with the recreation complex, um, which is necessary for that area in particular. Um, if we grow into the north, one of the ideas um, about the development and growing into the north is that it's contiguous with, contiguous with the city. So our services are there, our transportation is already uh, set to be able to grow. But we're already recognizing problems within our transit system with the hub and spoke system where everything comes back downtown again. There are routes that this applies to and it's very effective, but we need routes in our transit system that are going to run north-south. We need to start looking more effectively at alternate forms of transportation, particularly cycling. Um, all the lanes or roads that you're development that you've been seeing the last little while, except in some of the older areas where it gets to be a little bit of a problem, but there are models for it. Uh, you're seeing more cycling lanes coming. Um, if you look at the, even the Sheltered Lane development right now, or the Gretzky Parkway development in the north, it's all been a matter of, um, of putting trails on the sides of those things, uh, the sides of those roads. Access to the 403, that really leads down to the BSAR. That plan was designed 50 years ago. I'm 47 years old. It was designed before I was born. It's a time to look at it again and understand the transportation route from the southwest to the 403, whether it travels west, whether it travels through the city and east. But we have to improve our transportation corridor, particularly around Colburn and Dalhousie, because we're putting too much impact on those particular streets and those particular neighborhoods. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Dave Robel. There are three great questions that come with this. I think the first one I want to focus on is the BSAR. BSAR has two components in it to have a link between Wayne Gretzky Expressway and the Veterans, which will cross across the Glebelands. And that will take some very careful negotiating um, and partnership with Six Nations in order to allow for the easements that are there based on a 50-year-old plan, which may work effectively and may not work effectively. Second area of connection is between Shellers Lane moving out towards the 403. That may be an easier solution to deal with and completing that smaller link, it will cost money. That means sitting down with the province and renegotiating an agreement that was lost that covered 80% of the funding for the BSAR uh, several years back. I doubt we're going to see the same level of coverage, but that's one area that needs to be focused on. That may be one that's a little easier to work with, and as a leader, we should be able to tackle that one in smaller bites. The other area is about the development in our community. We have an official plan review, and there are areas within our own municipality, ladies and gentlemen, that have an ability to be developed now. I'm going to use the old Canadian Tire site on Colburn Street that could have been developed for high-rise apartments, high-density apartments, to deal with geared-to-income, people who are struggling, people who are looking for places to live. It could have been for student housing. It's not that far off the mark from downtown, and still creates an ability to infill we respectfully need. We also have a draft plan that's been sat on that we could have started implementing and working with community partners years ago to put our own home builders back in business and back to work. That's a two-year targeted plan and talking with professionals in the development industry. I work towards that industry on, on a parallel to it. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? There are plans. It's a matter of getting down to business, setting some targets, and chasing those targets to fulfill those needs for our community. Mary Ellen Kay. <laughs> Well, when I look when I look at it, we have also 
We have driver behavior that we have to consider. One of the things when I looked at the Shelly Lane, I went on to MapQuest, we have technology to look at. A GPS unit will still direct people down Brand Avenue, regardless of which way. It will be the first option because that is considered Highway 2, Highway 24, and will still direct people down Brand Avenue. One of the things to look at with Brand Avenue is why oh why were we ever allowing parking along Brand Avenue? It's a main arterial road. There is parking in all the businesses behind it. That's one of the areas to free up some of the congestion along here in the downtown is Brant Avenue to be a no parking zone. Because it's, it's going to feed into both. If I go on to MapQuest and I research that from Sobeys in West Brant and I took it from the, the Hamilton Spectator building, it showed me that on, if I go down Wilson Street and down the old 53 highway there, it's only a three minute difference at one o'clock in the afternoon. The problem changes when we have congestion uh, later on in the day. So clearing up some of those problems with the Brant Avenue part, it's an arterial road, it's a matter of fairness. Linden Road, you can't park along it. King George Road, you can't park along it. It's two, two lanes both ways. The other part when I was coming down to Lucy one, one time is uh, having a better system that is enforced with unloading shipments of trucks. Because they're double parked both sides, there's parking here, parking there, you've got several lanes, and then there's another truck blocking another lane. Some of these are simple solutions that can alleviate a lot of the, um, the, the congestion, thank you very much, <laughs> in this. They're not expensive solutions, they're logical, but because we also have driver behavior that is very different. 50 years ago, they didn't think there'd be GPS units. Now people make all of their decisions around that. Not the ones that I don't use one, but I'm thinking when I look at it. But it's only a three minute difference. So those are some of the thinking that I bring to this discussion in development. Yes, the, all of these old abandoned sites need to be looked at and it won't happen if we keep developing around the ring of the city on the green space. Jan Vanderstow. I'm not even tempted. <laughs> not. Uh, okay. We know we're going to intensify. We know we're going to see more than one car per household in West Brant and in other places in the city where there is infill projects happening. We know that. That's commonplace. We also know that we do not have, outside of Garden Avenue, uh, a circumvential route around the city. We simply do not have it. Go to any other municipality, big or small, you will find circumvential routes around most of them because it moves tra tra traffic faster and safer. What happened when the bridge shut down the other day? Total chaos and shut down. You can't move people. Okay. What will we do when we don't negotiate from a proper standpoint on the BSAR? I think we will stall again for another 25 years of finishing that roadway. <coughs> Not only will we cut off a neighborhood and jump over a canal or a lake and go through someone else's land. It hasn't been negotiated from a standpoint other than this is what the city is going to do. We also have that problem with the county. If we were to plan circumvention routes around the city, we also run up against an obstacle there because we're not in the best of relationship with the county of Brant as well. Either way, what we have to do is we have to move on safe arterial routes people through or around the city. And if we, if we begin that process by simply stating what our plans are and going ahead without talking to the interested parties, what we're essentially doing is stalling the process and stalling the traffic. It's time to rebuild our relationships with not only Six Nations, but with the people in the county. Help them understand our needs. We want to understand their needs and work together when we do that, we can actually access funding from both the provincial and the federal government to help us with our infrastructure problems. That's where to start, not by arbitrarily making decisions again and again. Thank you. Mark Lutel. <coughs> thank you, and thank you, Michael, for sitting down. I'm feeling a little bit rough, but I'll get through that. So for you, I'll point out that this is not the St. Amon that was the MP. This is the St. Amon that ran under the Hudak government, so we got that clarified. So, uh, BSAR issue first. 
Firstly, in the mayor's first term, instead of the province being on the hook for 80% of the cost of the construction of the VSAR, the council under his leadership took an $11 million payout. Do we need to finish the final link to enhance our infrastructure? We sure do, but it's going to be very costly. I'll make sure that we're very transparent and clearly show the DC charges collected and apply them. But more importantly, I think because of the delicacy of the Glebe lands, we need to look at an east-west corridor going from Garden Ave to Rest Acres Road. And I think that we could probably work that in with the county one way or another. In regards to development, I would make it my goal that we would try and get a deal with the county in the first 12 months. And I think with the proper negotiating in the, in the area of fairness, I believe the discussion could be completed. In the meantime, we do have some industrial land, but more importantly, we have some land in the Southwest. Four years ago, I took a leadership role and created the uh, Southwest Recreational Plan, which was completed in 2010. In 2011, it became a shelf study. They're starting to do something on it now, but there's a lot of land there that we could be used to get our local builders back to work. We could have a secondary school that is much needed to fill the needs in that area, along with the recreational center and football fields and soccer fields and baseball fields that we're in desperate need for. So that would get us back to work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, John Turmel. Oh, did I? oh, I'm sorry. I am. Yeah. Michael St. Germain, you'll have to sit down for a second. <laughs> I always sit beside John. He's actually a cool guy. S-E-T. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, the issue of the transportation routes, it, it boggles my mind. You know, I, I've been in uh, Brantford here, I think, about 10 years. And that issue keeps coming up. Uh, there's no resolution. We're working on a 50-year-old plan. Nobody sits down. People are talking about negotiating a deal in a month, which is unbelievable. And um, we're told we got to consult, consult. I mean, when, as a city, are we, are we going to sit down and, and say, we got to move on, we got to do business, we need the transportation routes to support economic development, we need economic development to create jobs, we lost 1,400 jobs the past year, we've got 1,800 people who are no longer looking for work because they can't find any, and the urgency is creeping up on us. What I'm telling people is it, it's time to stop and get off the treadmill. Let's sit down. Let's get focused. Let's put together deals and transactions that work for both parties. Recognize that First Nations has issues. We've got to look to address those. Recognize the county has issues. We've got to address those. Recognize we got issues and they got to address those. But let's get on with it. Quit the bullshit. <laughs> I agree, let's do things right, and if we are going to be saving money on our snow removal budget, we can buy more buses, and with more buses traveling more often, more people might be induced to take the bus instead of driving the car with parking and gas and all that stuff, especially if you can use some of their kids' bus box, right? The kids are in bus box, you just might decide to take the bus and leave the car at home. So, of course, he's spending his own anyway, so you might have to go out and shovel some yourself. So, now, transportation. Yeah, more buses is great, but there are some really dense traffic flows in Brantford. You're going down St. Paul, making a left on the Brant, you get an advance green. Guess what? The other guys go in the other direction. They got a no turn on red. Pedestrians can't cross. It's like Brant Avenue to St. Paul losing 15% of each cycle on a stupid no red on green that's advanced for those guys. You understand what I'm saying? Three other spots like that in town. So how can you complain about traffic being too much when you run it like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> so if you got a no right turn on a red while the other floor has got an advanced green, you need repair up here. 
Oh, and I love the idea of Shalom Lane expanded to the north. Gee, no funding. I could solve that. Just needs a bridge. Thank you very much, John. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, our next question will revert to the one-minute answers, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and it has to do with Brantford's water. How will you take leadership and accountability to improve water quality, and this writer says remove fluoride, uh, and also they're concerned about the management of water and sewer rates. So there are two parts to this, the quality of the water, the water and sewer rates. The first one to answer would be Michael Sagamore. My family comes from a plumbing background, so it's probably <laughs> appropriate to get this. I don't know about the fluoride. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the question came up the other night, and when I left the meeting, I went home and, and I started Googling a whole bunch of People who I, I presume know what they're talking about say fluoride's great. I googled somewhere else, and for, the message was, "Well, I'm going to die from fluoride." I mean, I, I really don't know. But if it's an issue that that concerns a lot of citizens, I, I do believe that's something we can consult on. With respect to the issue of the management of the, of the water system, our, our um, there's just been a infrastructural improvement. Um, on the water system, talking to the people that, that, that um, work for the city. Um, they say there, that there's uh, ample supply uh, for the next decade. Um, I think what we have to look at are rates and fees. Thank you. Our next answer will be from Chris Friel, number five. As I said, the, the fluoride question comes up and it is a debate that goes back and forth. But the one issue that I can't quite understand with fluoride, um, and I've not really had it answered, is when we're talking about fluoride being good for your teeth, um, we're also talking about generally the concept is that you're ingesting it. And uh, it's already been demonstrated that ingesting fluoride does not, it never actually makes its way to your teeth. Um, so I don't really understand the concept um, in this day and age and with a lot of the research that's there. We have a new uh, water treatment facility. Um, we've been able to cut dramatically the amount of chlorine, and you probably have noticed it um, because we moved through ozone UV. Um, it was, and through rates, uh, that we were able to do that work. We have issues with sewage treatment plant. It is with through rates that we are able to improve capacity and do the maximization study. There needs to be value for the dollar in your rates, and public need to understand that more. We have not done a good job of that in all of our history, uh, but it is something that we can work at very specifically and very directly. Thank you. Next answer comes from Mark Littell. Thank you. Well, I sure hope the water's safe because I assume that's what we're drinking up here, uh, Nora. But since Walkerton, you know, you can be assured that one thing I learned as a counselor is that our water is extremely safe. And we should rest comfortably that the best water we could get, the cleanest water we could get is probably not out of a bottle, but it's right out of the tap. There's a cost that goes along with that. Now, one thing I'd like to do is, because the costs seem to keep going up and up, is just to have an efficiency audit of the operations. But I can tell you that we do not make a profit on the water or on the sewage costs. Those are done at a neutral cost to us, to the, to the taxpayer. Um, in regards to fluoride, um, I'm with the same as everybody on this one. I know that it helps with the teeth. Um, I grew up in an area that didn't have it, and we had teeth problems when I was younger. Um, I would. Somebody smarter than me has to come up with the reason to remove fluoride out of the water. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess it's coming up. <laughs> but not yet. Oh. They rebel next. I guess the question of fluoride in the water or fluoride out of the water becomes a conundrum for many people because of what you hear from both sides. Nothing wrong if 50% say that there's a problem, 50% say there is not. Why don't we reduce the problem by reducing the amount of fluoride in our water by 50% as a compromise to both sides? <laughs> Simple solution and practical. Uh, the other issue is water rates and water conservation. 
We are currently uh, supported by water rates. As you dump water down uh, the drain, it's cost you for the disposal of that water. Here's the conundrum that comes with that, ladies and gentlemen, that as we start to become more conservational or conservationist with our water, somewhere that supply of water and that maintenance of water has to be maintained. So we conserve. You know the rates are going to go up to find that balance of dollars and cents. This is what I would like to say is it's going to take 10 members of council plus a good mayor to <coughs> pool resources and ideas together to help assist in finding a balance that will meet those needs. Thank you. Mary Ellen? Yes, I, I too have... I too see all sorts of research both ways. If we had the health unit here, I have friends who are in the health unit in different areas of Ontario and they've said fluoride, fluoride for children's teeth right from the beginning. And I know I, I just know it would be an interesting debate to hear. And we're due to have that debate at City Hall to hear both sides, all sides, share about fluoridation. And, and I, I would be looking forward to hearing that at City Hall and then making a decision based upon what I hear there. Um, one of the things that has been brought to my attention is lead in the pipes. And when we talk about safety of water, it could be wonderful coming out of the treatment plant. However, if it doesn't make it down into uh, our homes safely, a lot of tenant households have lead. And that new school, there seems to be a rush to build another school down in Shellard Lane area, the one that was built. Students have to use bottled water because the, the person who installed the pipes it never passes a water test that they can actually have it due to the high amounts of lead in the brand new building. So that's something the trustee needs to be asked about. And they have to flush every constantly. Thank you very much. Okay, John, it's your turn. On our flyer, it's one of our points, the Lancet Medical Journal, most prestigious of all, this March wrote, that studies have documented additional developmental neurotoxicants, fluoride. Now, fluoride's a poison, and if they didn't put it in our water, they'd have to dispose of it expensively. Now, 98% of it doesn't even get into you. It's flushed down the toilet or in the showers. So, most of the fluoride they would have to dispose of, they don't have to because we put in our water and flush it into the environment for them. And of the 2% you don't drink, hardly any touches our teeth. Anyway, so here's my point. Say there are 50% of the people who want it. I think they're development challenged that they can't do their research and realize the chemistry. And 52, why should I be subjected to the poison they want just add it to your own. And for people worried about cavities, the city will provide free toothbrushes we get at the dollar store. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, Jan Vanderstel. Thank you. Um, a lot has been said about fluoride. Fluoride Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sunday afternoons and the rest of the week you can remove it. So just save your water in your fridge for your use. It might work, who knows. The worst problem is you've been overcharged for water for about 15 years. We've had the capacity to produce double the water that we do, and we don't really share it. We don't sell it. There's one, a couple of spaces in the county where we do sell it. We're strategically, in a strategic financial plan, we're, we're bound to charge enough water to maintain the pipes, the pressure, the quality, and the pumps. We have to maintain that in order to be sure we can supply you with water tomorrow, next week, and next month. When we're a conservation of waters, your, your, uh, your prices go up. If we produced double the water and worked with the county on sale of the water, your prices would go down. Here's another question from the audience. <clears throat> the Waterfront Master Plan is a fantastic plan that provides suggestions on how to use and to promote our river. What are your thoughts on the plan? How, when would you begin to implement the plan? So, when would you implement it? How would you do it? And what are your thoughts on the Waterfront 
master plan. I'm going back to the order that we started with at the first question, so that would be John Trammell again. Okay, so I would have these Brant River cleanups and beautified days more often. You hear about it once a year, a few people get out there and clean the river around Brant Crossing and they get a couple of hot dogs. I want kids out there every weekend cleaning it up for bus tickets. Don't you? Can you think of an easier way? Can you? Right now they got no money. They want to fix it, but they can't. I got no money either. But I can pay those kids with bus tickets to move every piece of junk out of that river. So, and of course we can always pay some companies with bus credits to truck in some sand. No reason we couldn't have a few truckloads of sand brought in. Especially if they'll do it for a few taxes off their bill. So we're always trading empty something, buses, students, uh, classroom seats, to get something of value ver as time. So basically, we can use the same mechanism once again to beautify our river, have work bees like in the past, where you could pay your taxes by working for the city. We call it bus bucks to get the kids. Thank you very much. Mark Littell. Uh, the year 2010, we completed the waterfront master plan, which I was in complete support of. We also uh, devoted $350,000 a year for implementation of the waterfront master plan. Which, so there's now $1.4 million sitting in the bank for, from the casino funds to implement that, and I haven't seen anything done with it. I ride, I ride along the waterfront every day in the summer till the weather turns. I consider that the jewel of the city. It's one of the most important things that we have. We're drinking that water right now. Whatever we need to do to get that plan implemented to stop any further <coughs> development from occur occurring, I will support. Thank you. Thank you. Michael St. I live down by the uh, river and uh, walk my dog along the trails down there. and. Uh, it's probably one of the most serene and rewarding experiences I have uh, in the day. What I don't understand is, I come from a town called Penetang Machine, which is up north. We had a, a, the bay and, and it was completely covered with bush and whatever. The citizens decided that what they were going to do is turn it into an open park and that, and everybody chipped in and, and, and helped. We just seem to look to the municipal government to tell us what to do with, with, with the river. I mean, there's got to be more to it than that. It, it, it's a resource that each of us share. We have the master plan in place. Like everything else, we've spent a lot of time talking, we've spent hours consulting, but maybe now it's time to start and get some action and get something done with it. Thank you. Mary Ellen? I'm glad to hear in the question that you like the waterfront master plan. I was first advocating it. I went up to Toronto. Somebody, somebody said, oh, cities don't do master plans. Oh, don't do that. Uh, so, and I went up to Toronto and saw that they have a waterfront master plan, and they, they were working it through. It has turned into something that is on the shelf here at City Hall, along with a lot of other studies that go along, and the master aging plan as well, six-year delay on that. I've seen some of the things get get fixed up in some of the areas and access. Mo most of that's been access. So it's one of those one of those plans that has been dear to my heart. I advocated for it. It would be coming off the shelf. Mohawk Lake would be cleaned up along 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 the waterfront. It is part of our identity of the city. You have to start with the geography that you started with. We don't need an identity project. We have a beautiful, beautiful river that we need to, we need to continue to reclaim and keep it healthy for all of us. Thank you. Jan Vanderstep. True. Uh, $300,000 a year in casino funding to go to the Waterfront Master Plan. Uh, and just recently, $400,000 from council contingencies, making about $2 million that we've spent on legal fees in a fight against <laughs> development in the Northwest. That's our waterfront master plan. What else is it? It's Brantford's waterfront master plan. The real estate values on the other side of the river with an evergreen landscape 
river uh, backed property just skyrocketed. This is not the entire waterfront master plan. That's just only half the river. Only Brantford's half of the river. Still, we don't talk with the other side of the river. We don't talk with the county and involve them in the process of building and maintaining an evergreen space on both sides of the river. It's only one side. Has it cost $2 million so far? Yes, it has. Have we seen the benefits? Have we seen the investment, even, even Brantford's side? Not yet. Thank you. Dave Rabel? This is one of those times I wish I had a whiteboard marker. Because I think one of the things we want to look at is what we do in the first 100 or 120 days of council. We know that this is an incredibly deep concern because we've heard it here at every member that's, uh, that's spoken so far. We've heard the questions in numerous debates about the water plan. We've seen the legal costs and the legal battles that go with it. It's a three-way partnership, ladies and gentlemen. It is a partnership between six nations. It is a partnership between the county. It is a partnership between the city. In order to implement a waterfront master plan successfully, one, you need the money. Two, you need the partners and the buy-in. And when you start to do that, you have to start within our own ranks as councils. And one of those things you do is sit down with ten members of council and the mayor and you say, what is it that's important about this waterfront master plan that we can implement and we can implement sooner than later and we can do it with our community partners? That's how we start the process. You check mark the boxes, create the plan, and find the dollars, find the partnerships, and implement. Thank you. And that leaves Chris Frio. The Waterfront Master Plan has not sat on a shelf. In fact, it was the key component to the OMB decision uh, for sifting Grandview. In fact, that was one of the main arguments that we worked on was that we had the Waterfront Master Plan and we wanted to be able to uh, develop this and this development was going to affect our ability to be able to maintain and manage the Waterfront Master Plan. And in essence, that's what uh, we won that and uh, we see some incredibly uh, uh, powerful new tools available to us. But that work was all done through the Waterfront Master Plan. Our staff were working through it. The consultants we hired were working through it. The lawyers that we had were working through it. And it's going to set the tone for the rest of the area. One of the things that I think we have to consider is that for the most part, the city, the municipality, doesn't own the land adjacent to the river. We have to work with the landowners to be able to identify it. And one of the things I also want to... We have a wild river that runs through our community. You can be on Lauren Bridge and watch fly fishermen and the deer in the morning. Let's not lose that because somebody wants to build next to the river. Let's not lose what is important and significant about the Grand River. It is a wild river. Allow it to be a river, not a built space. Thank you. Another question. If you are elected as mayor of Brantford, what will you do to implement better opportunities for young adolescents to get involved in the community? How will you enable young adolescents to get involved in the community? It's kind of an open question, so the first one who gets to try it is Jan Vanderstow. I think we do an awfully good job of providing sports venues, sports activities, and, uh, and general uh, a sporting thrust to what Brantford does. We, I think we do that well. Uh, there are some areas that are perhaps uh, in need of some work. I, I believe that there needs to be more investment into arts and culture, dance, theater. Uh, I don't know where Brantford's black box theater is. I, I haven't found it yet. We have a large theater that doesn't seem to work for many community organizations. I haven't found Brantford's outdoor amphitheater. I haven't found uh, I haven't found a museum that is uh, frequented. Um, there's there's many things that many interests that are reflected in our, our our youth in our city that don't seem to have a positive outlet, and it's something we need to pay more attention to. And but continue the the sports funding and the sports uh, um, enthusiasm as well. Thank you, Michael Saint Amand. I was sort of sitting here thinking, what would I do with my kids? Um, if I want to involve them, they, they have to have an aspiration. Yeah, the aspiration could be a job. 
which were shorter than the community. It could be an opportunity to do volunteer work. And I take exception to Jan's comment that we don't have a museum that, that's uh, visited. I mean, uh, I'm president of the uh, Branch Historical Society. We do have people come to the museum. And they are university students. There are a lot of opportunities to involve students, to involve young people. But what you've got to do is to give them a dream to work towards. And the people in Brantford right now, I mean, they don't see that they're going to get a job. They don't see that they've got something to volunteer for. And that's the tragedy. That's why they come, they stay, then they leave. Thank you. John Turmel. Well, this one's up my alley, right? All we got to do is pay them, and they'll do it. Yeah, okay. They're going to try and dream up some way of inducing youth to come and do work without getting paid. Have fun trying. But Hong Kong found that their students were willing to work for bus credits on their bus cards. We got bus cards. All we got to do is adapt some readers in the rec centers, and they can use them there, not just bus rides. Again, I don't, I'm not going to run out. He's right, they don't see a job. Well, that's because you need a paycheck for a job, and these guys got no money for youth. There are bigger projects that the money has to go for. All I got is bus tickets. But believe it or not, six bus tickets an hour, and that would give those kids the hope and the vision and all those good things they want to give them, they can't, because they don't have bus tickets, and I do. <laughs> Chris Frio. I go out of my way to make sure that I have uh, lots of opportunity to speak to young people, whether it's in the schools or even uh, um, downtown. Um, young people have to have a voice, and they need the mechanism to have a voice. We do these things with uh, young people, 13, 14 year olds, where we say, tell us what you think. Instead of engaging them and allowing them to start to, to allow their minds to free flow and think about what they need, we expect them to be adults when they're, when they're still youth. And we have to start to think and listen to them more effectively. Social media is a powerful tool. They're all, uh, all kids I know, minor, on their phones all the time, but we still need to be able to engage them and draw them into uh, effective face-to-face uh, um, uh, -face involvement. We have the Laurier uh, Student Council. It's a great resource available to us. We run leadership programming all summer long and have a youth council in place through Parks and Recreation. They give us fantastic feedback. What we need to be able to do is create that, that venue, that opportunity for that voice to be heard, and then on our end, through council, we have to be able to listen and really understand what their needs are and going forward, not tell them what their needs are. Thank you. Dave Rebell. <clears throat> Terrific. We have a wonderful group of individuals, and I think it takes all of about 30 seconds to take a sport coat off and take a vest off and take your tie off grab a skateboard and sit down with these kids over behind the casino and ask them simply, what's going to be better for you? And engage the question. It's not just asking the question, it's engaging. And engaging means how you draw them out from the conversation, because I'm a total stranger. You're going to have to find those types of venues. You're going to have to advertise those types of venues. You're going to have to create sport openings for them that are affordable for their parents to get those kids that are involved. That's dollars and cents. And that's how you're going to engage our youth. You're going to make it affordable for the parents going to make it affordable for them. Now there's a coalition called the Brand Youth Wellness Coalition and they were dealing with stuff like social media and how it becomes an entrapment, a social entrapment to those individuals and we've got to be able to break those types of molds to engage those youth. I think that's a long, hard process because the dynamics of society have changed dramatically. How do we do something that simple? It's not that simple, ladies and gentlemen, because we watch the tides turn. What we'll end up having to do is to draw them back in and actually have to set the coat off and see that. Mary Ellen? I, I go by the skateboard, skateboard parks. I see them well used. People are, the students are really happy to see them. And, and they, they get a chance to interact freely with them. When I, they don't need to have any money to do that. A lot of parents that I've talked to in, in youth, some of them, they're limited by the organized sports that we have. They would love to participate, but mom and dad are both working or a single parent household where mom can't take you different places. That's a limit. So skateboard parks, uh, some of those in our park system, free access to that. One of the areas that uh, a couple friends have brought to my attention was 
They wanted to develop that entrepreneur spirit in their, in their child. Opportunities where, um, during the summer, different types of ideas of, of like hot dog, different types, I don't, I, like, a, um, I, I kind of wish that the old lemonade stand was back, where a child gets to a chance to explore what, it like, what it's like to be an entrepreneur. That would be a nice thing to, to explore. And um, the other part is the transportation part with part-time jobs, the students that are able to do that, Again, transportation. If we had a better transportation system with public transit, they could get to those start those starting jobs that they could get to without their parents having to take them back and forth. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, Mark Littell. I'd really like the questioner to come up and explain to me what they're looking for, because there's only one area that we're down on, but, you know, we've got two museums in the city minimally. We've got a skateboard park. We've got Harmony Square, which is being used all the time. We've got a Gretzky Center, Civic Center, Lions Park, Woodman uh, Community Pool. There is an abundance of things for the youth to do. Uh, our trail system is probably the best in North America. If you haven't utilized it, utilize it. The one spot the city has dropped the ball on is football fields. Right now, the youth have to go out of town because the last weekend the youth had to go out of town because the football fields were closed. That was an area of planning that we need to work on. But other than that, there's a ton of things for them to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just have one more question, uh, and it will be another fairly short one, I guess. And I don't actually know the background to this, so you may want to just comment. Uh, some municipalities have passed laws that prohibit donations from corporations and unions for municipal election campaigns. Got that? Yeah. So just comment on this statement. And I'll ask Dave Rubel to go first. I'm not sure where that stands completely, <coughs> considering when you read the Municipal Elections Act, it tells who can make contributions and who can't. So I think the starting point would be lobbying the province to make that. Now, if the city wants to create its own bylaws, uh, not only does it go maybe beyond the idea of dealing with finances, I have no difficulty with that. Um, you're going to have to be very careful because as you choose to go to a higher office, it costs a fair amount of money. And then the caution you have to make sure is you're not in the back pockets of those developers because sometimes when that money does get exchanged, there is this tip of attack. Um, I did for you, you're going to do for me. So I conscientiously make that. You're going to do those types of bylaws, and let's take it a little step further and also deal with the proliferation of signs, because there's other municipalities that do the same thing. Be respectful to your neighbors, and maybe limit signs, or in fact, say no to signs at all, or limit the time that we have for signs for a 30-day period. These are all things that can be tweaked to make a better community, to make sure that there's a whole degree of openness and transparency for you and for those leaders. Thank you. Mary Ellen. <clears throat> well, I myself am I'm a person that, that is not funded by anybody else but individuals and myself. I find that it, it clears me out to be independent, so that I'm not beholden to anybody, uh, a, a corporation or a business that has a business interest. I can be there for the citizens. And that's one of the things that I, I, I find stands really true in this race. I can come up with my platform and truly make it something that is meeting the vulnerable in our city, not just business interests, but the vulnerable. And you'll see, you, I think if you look through my platform, you'll see that the vulnerable are somebody that I can pay attention to because I am funding myself and some individuals, but they're not corporations, they're not business interests. Chris Friel. This came up in the last election too, and to be honest, um, I'm not wealthy enough. I'm a father of two teenage children and I'm middle class. Um, running a campaign now, particularly after the last election, some of the dollar sums that were spent, um, you're looking at uh, $30,000, $35,000 uh, to be able to do that. And we do go out and we seek donations, we do go out and um, solicit funds wherever possible, but it is all open. Uh, any of these funds are above a certain amount. Are, uh, the individuals are listed, which is $99. The individuals are listed. It's available through the audit. It is reviewed through the audit. The Municipal Act refers or looks at and allows opportunity. So you can't have donations from related companies. You can't have um, three companies under the same holding company giving you dollars. 
Uh, it is very difficult in this day and age for anybody who wants to enter into government to be able to, to fund that project. My first election in 1994, we funded it through garage sales and spaghetti dinners, and it was $8,000. The last elections, the highest dollars spent were almost $35,000. Thank you. John Termel? Well, because I think of politics as an intellectual exercise, it doesn't bother how much money my candidates can raise from their friends. It's all open, like you said, there's nothing hidden or corrupt. And why should that matter? Now, of course, if it isn't an intellectual exercise and the guy who's got the greatest goodies at the party and the biggest fleet of cars to carry his brain-dead voters to the polls wins on a regular basis, well, then, okay, money matters. But someday, the guy with the smartest idea will win. And money won't matter. And that day might not be now, but I hope someday the guy with the brightest idea gets in. Thank you, John. <laughs> John Vanderstone? I think, it's, I think it's a fair-minded prospect to believe that people who can spare $20 towards a campaign give it, and they give it with their heart, and they mean, I support you, and I want you to be able to make the change that I believe needs to be made in this city, or this province, or this region, whatever it is. Equally, if somebody's able to give $200 because they've been blessed in that way, uh, they're wealthier, they, can, they have more disposable income, I say we shouldn't limit them. If on the other hand, there are people who can give much more than that. Some campaigns, they require that. When, when I ran for council four years ago, it was smaller donations that I wanted to accept because it was very difficult for, for me to uh, post a, uh, a large amount of spending uh, during that campaign. With a, with a citywide campaign, I felt more comfortable saying that we had spent more money on the campaign. You have to reach more people in more areas. I wouldn't want to restrict the choices that people have. If they believe you fully, and your cause fully, they should be able to support to the greatest extent that is a bit allowable by law. Sorry. Mark Littell? Thank you. The reality is, is that it costs money to run a campaign. If you're doing advertising, if you've got lawn signs, it adds up to several thousands of dollars. In 2010, Tim Phelps, who was a, uh, a, a reporter for the Brantford Expositor, had asked us to reveal our sources. And I believe that this was a result of the 2006 election, where over 50% of the fundraising by one mayoral candidate came from one source, his family, his friends, his relatives, and employees. And so you need to be transparent for sure. I can tell you there is not one single group that is giving to me more than anybody else and everybody is sticking by the laws. But it costs money to run a campaign. The campaigns in, in uh, Toronto, I know John Tory is around $1.5 million, as is the Fords and Olivia Chow. So it costs money to run a campaign, but I'm as clean as a whistle on this one. Thank you. <laughs> and Michael St. Jeez, I, I, I think I'm in trouble with how much money these guys are all spending. <laughs> Except John, he's using uh, bus bucks. The, um, uh, you know, the biggest donation I, I got, and this is the truth, is about $200. And, and I was all over the guy, like I love him. <laughs> I got uh, $99 from a whole bunch of people. And uh, I got a little bit of money, and, and I contributed a little bit myself. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm not spending thirty thousand dollars in my campaign. I, I got X amount of signs, and once they're up, they're up. And uh, I got X amount of brochures. Once they're gone, they're gone. And either elect me or don't. But my life goes on. But uh, uh, that's what what my campaign is about. It's fairly simple. Thank you very much. We'll move now to our closing statements. Before I, I do that, though, I'd just like to thank you all for, for being very, very direct in your answers and for keeping within the time frame and for taking all of our questions seriously. It was very good. I think we could give them a little applause.
for the closing statement, we're going to go in the reverse order from what we did at the very beginning. That means we start with number seven, who's day for Bill. I'm always just start with Yahoo and I get to go first. <laughs> Teamwork brings change, ladies and gentlemen. Change invites the opportunities, and the opportunities will build success. In order to achieve those accomplishments, we need to start with a plan. The last four years, there's been no clearly defined plan that we can pinpoint and market our successes. We can talk about it, but can we prove it to you? Words, not the ideals of drawing something on a board that we can check off. Ladies and gentlemen, I have four items in our plan that are very specific. One that focuses on the development in our community. The other is the accountability to you and to our community as well. Value for the dollars spent, not only for your tax dollars, but dollars that are spent for programs for our youth, for our seniors. Look at the economic strategies that we can develop for our community. But it doesn't take one man as a mayor to do that, or one lady as a mayor to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes 11 unique individuals to be able to come into a room and work together collectively, respectfully, and cohesively. That's the word all, not most, not some. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been approachable for nine years as a member of council. You can catch me at a corner store, a variety store, anywhere. And I will take the time to talk to you because your voice is important to me. You matter to me. I am a servant to this community and will continue to be a servant to this community. It takes nothing to pick up a shovel. It takes nothing to see your neighbor struggle with a snowblower to walk over and give him a hand or her a hand. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the type of leadership I bring. I lead from within, in the middle. I help those who are weaker, allow those who are stronger to fly their own flags. On October 27th, there's an opportunity for voice and change, and that change is called a rebellion. <laughs> you're all laughing, but it's great because you're going to remember that. On October 27th, make your voice heard, make your voice for the change, stand up for the rebellion, but pay rebel for mayor. Michael St. Germain. We, we've, we've had four years, and has your life improved? The Expositor released a poll yesterday, and, and uh, it, it placed where the candidates were. And what was interesting about that poll was not so much where the lead was, but the fact that 77% of the citizens of Brantford are saying they want change, or are thinking about change. And to me, that's a driving comment. We got less people employed today than we had a year ago. We got 1,800 people that don't have uh, the desire to continue looking for work. We've got city expenditures that I would argue are out of control, and I'd love to have a debate on the budget. We've got plans to move the city forward, but we haven't dealt with the issues that have been around for 12, 15, 20 years sometimes. 50 if you count the BSAR. You know, it, it, it's time to sit back, have a calm, cool approach, and that's what I think I bring to the table. I really want to be mayor of Brantford. I'm not going to die if I'm not elected, or I won't die if I'm not elected, but I really want to be mayor because I think we need four years of the type of leadership I can bring, which is based on strong business experience. It's based on the fact that I've negotiated tough deals all over Canada. And it's based on the fact that, you know, I don't just think about numbers. I mean, one of the criticisms I hear is all you're going to do is, is uh, talk about numbers. Well, no. I think with the heart. I care about seniors. My platform is built around seniors. It's built on delivering services to young families. Going forward, you have a choice. And it'll be outlined quite clearly to you. You can go with the vision for the future, or you can say, let's fix things now. Thank you very much. Next one is Chris Frio. 20 years ago, when I was first elected, we began the process of reinventing our community. We are now a 21st century city, a progressive community, a cutting edge community. And we are being recognized for this across the province and now even after today internationally, which is a lot of fun. That was because of leadership and vision. And I've been mayor for 13 of the last 20 years. Uh, many of the issues that have started uh, or that are driving our process now are renewed economic development, Laurier in the downtown, 
All of these issues started under my leadership. It's because I have a vision and I understand how to take a vision and implement it and make it a reality. This council was a roll of the sleeves council. We got down to work and we accomplished a great deal. Was all of it sexy? No. Because what we were doing was getting to the heart of the problems. We weren't wringing our hands, repeating the problem, talking about it over and over again. We were coming up with solutions and looking at ways of solving it. We were looking at ways of recognizing that a lot of the problems that we have, the challenges that we have as a community, are about generations. And we have to start now or we're not going to be able to affect those generations. That's what Smart Brantford's about. That's what Safe Brantford's about. That's what Healthy Brantford is about. It is creating a vibrant Brantford. That is everything that we are working towards. And all of us have to join in that together. All of those programs are broad-based community initiatives. Everybody has been involved. As many people as possible have been involved. And we've tried to make broad teams. It's not just about City Hall. It never has been, and it never should be. And we made sure in this council that we took the power out of City Hall, and we engaged the public, and we brought them in. I've been Brantford's mayor for 13 of the last 20 years. I want to continue to be Brantford's mayor. I am asking for your support, and I am asking for your vote on October 27th. Thank you. Mark Littell. Try not to spill anything. We have a problem. People come to Brantford to get a bigger bang for their real estate dollars, and get hit, hit big time on their taxes. Now they're looking to move out and telling me they can't afford the taxes in this city. We have to stop the bloating, so let's work together. How do we stop this? While working with members of council and knowing the mayor only has one vote, I'll commit to the following in the first year. Number one, I will not support any increase in the 2015 budget and will work with staff and council to move forward with an efficiency audit of the city's operation, how to do more with less. Bring council together to develop goals, objectives, and priorities for the next term of office so that council's efforts are more focused in meeting the needs of the community. Number three, begin discussions with the county on joint economic development and approach the land transfer negotiations with a view to creating a winning agreement that truly addresses the needs and priorities of both communities, not just one. We need to bring increased investment and should be using our major assets to promote us as a destination, not just for travel, but for new industry to locate here. We are the home to Alexander Graham Bell, Wayne Gretzky, Joseph Grant, Pauline Johnson, James Hillier, the Wayne Gretzky Sports Center, the Grand River and its magnificent trail system, Her Majesty's Chapel of the Mohawks. Our proximity to the 403 along with the 401 and close to Detroit, Buffalo and Toronto should make us a desirable city to locate in for industry. On this campaign, I will be investing my own money because I can't afford this mayor anymore and I don't want to leave Brantford. Please support change. Vote for me on October 27th. Jan Vanderstel. We need to focus on relationship building. We have a broken relationship with the county, demanding what we want when we want it. It's not a negotiation process, it's a temptation process. We need to build our relationships from uh, a standpoint of respect and reciprocity, not only with the county, but with people at Six Nations. We are stalled and have been stalled for a great deal of time. The economic benefit that would have come from us working together with our neighbors would have far surpassed the needs that we have today. It's frustrating to see that it's been 13 years of doing the same thing and still having no agreement. I believe it comes from a lack of respect. I believe it comes from a lack of working together for the common good. It seems to me that the only thing that really matters uh, is that people get the opportunity to find work, to find play, and to find a safe place to live within the, not the defined boundaries of Brantford, but the combined 
boundaries of Brantford, Brant County. People don't care where they get their job. They don't care about the boundaries. We can do much better to grow our economic environment and enhance investment in this area if we finally come to an agreement, however small, with the County of Brant, with shared services, to land companies here that perhaps don't use temp services, temp agencies. Perhaps we could attract the types of business and the types of jobs on the serviced land that give people the opportunity in Brantford and Brant County what we so desperately need. It's a different approach, it's a respectful approach, and it hasn't yet been tried. I think the next four years need to be full of that type of attempt, that type of communication from the right person, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. John Turmel? <clears throat> well, I've raised three kinds of community currencies today. Bus bucks, paying kids with empty bus seats. And tuition bucks, same idea, empty class seats. Bond bucks, like used in Argentina, and when Russia crashed in the 90s, 750 states and states paid their employees with bond rubles. It's been done before. And you got to see Branford's historic $4 bill. So if you can't imagine it ever having been done, your great, great, great grandparents did it. So, now what's neat about this is Hong Kong paid their students. This was in 2011. I haven't heard of anything since. No other people have done it. So, but it's, been, it's doable. It's been done before. And this could be a template for the whole world. The whole world who have transportation hubs and buses could be putting their students to work using bus bucks. And we could be the first to really do it in style. <coughs> Only if you elect Johnny Engineer Termel. And remember, if you're out there humping your buns, shoveling the snow when the plow went by, and you see a bunch of kids doing nothing on the corner, just remember, John the Engineer is the one who's laughing last. <laughs> and Mary on K. Yes, I should stand. I'm committed to... I'm here because I, I, I am disappointed in my tax rates going up all the time. I am disappointed in that. I'm a single person who's trying to make ends meet living in her house. When I walk, I, I talk to people, we, we all have a finite amount of money. We all have a finite amount of money. I'm committed to, to, making, to helping people make ends meet with services that are actually going to help them stay, keep those jobs, get those shifts. People after 5 o'clock, they have to risk people that are on transit. And you, you can see in, in this that uh, in the handout, 23,000 is for women. 35,000 for men. That's 2011. That's the median. That's the midpoint income. We have a lot of people in Brantford that struggle. And there's a lot of people below that that have, at the door they've let me know that they appreciate that I notice them. I'm not the only one that, that has to really tighten up her, always work within a tight, tight budget. That's why I put my name in here is because I know how to work within tight budgets. And I also know that we need to reduce unnecessary spending. As you can hear with the traffic ideas that I've shared, there are often inexpensive solutions to some of these big infrastructure ideas. Because every time you say yes to some infrastructure, you have said yes to more debt. Whether it's the province or federally, you've said yes to more debt. And you've said yes to more taxes from somebody. So that's why, that's why I put my name in to run for mayor. I think differently. I have to think differently. I've always had to think differently <coughs> my entire life. I want to bring that to you as a, as a mayor. We also, have a, we also have a big addictions problem in Brantford that is ignored. It leads to violence, it leads to crime. And I think a mayor, whichever mayor you decide to pick, needs to have that as priority number one. It affects children, it affects everyone. It affects the productivity of our city. And yes, Brantford got a D by the Conference Board of Canada. Cities like St. John's, Newfoundland, they backed off their subdivision planning. You check it out, because they noticed when they started doing that, it hurt their economy of their city. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary.
So it's been great to have you all here, and I must applaud your, your interest in running at all, because I have been on that side of the table, and I know it, it's very exhausting, and it's a lot of hard work, and it does take some commitment, and I'm so glad you were able to be with us this evening.